Most of these problems involve using the tables, the airfoil data in the back of the book. So 5.2, you're given an angle of attack, a speed, it's at sea level, so you have to look up the density, then you're asked to find lift drag and pitching moment at the quarter cord point. So spot check your Reynolds number. Make sure you show me that calculation. I need to check it. Why did I get 10 to the fifth? Uh, let's calculate it. Does somebody have a calculator? Pardon? You got 10 of the, the numbers that go into it are point double O two three seven seven, right? Right? So I must have my exponent wrong. You're saying it's punch that out, you get is that right? Do it five more times. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So then you need that Reynolds number to look up the drag. You have to calculate Q infinity. So you should get that. Make sure you show me the work on that. Show me your calculation. And then you get CL about 0.68. And there's some leeway here because you're reading off the graph. So I will give you an error band about that when you read the charts. The main thing is show points picked. on the graph. The instructions are photocopy that page from the book and clearly mark where it is. If you put a little tiny point, hang on a second, if you put a little tiny point it's really hard to see I'm going to take off. Yeah. Yeah. If you really wanted to get fancy, you'd pick points off of each of the Reynolds numbers and then you'd plot them and then extrapolate the curve, but I'm not expecting you to do that. Why is the, the coefficient of moment, why is it negative? Is it negative in Reynolds? I hope so. Yeah, it's negative. It's below the zero. Now make sure you read, it's negative on either axis, but make sure you read the outer numbers for that on the plot, right? If you're looking at the airfoil data, there's the right across along the, uh, the left edge, there's the lift coefficient, and then you have to scoot out for the pitching moment coefficient. And then you multiply each of these by Q infinity S and S is the chord times unit span. So that's just punching these numbers times Q infinity and S. Everybody good on that one? Questions? I'm sorry, say again. Uh, that's the Reynolds number we've decided is right. If you read off the chart, you're going to get pretty close. The one that changes with Reynolds number is the drag. For what? Yeah, that's within the error tolerance of being able to read the chart.
You should have this as your Reynolds number calculation, though. Those. You have what? Yeah, I just check it. Okay, let's see. The next one is 5.5. .5. They give you the lift and they ask you what the area is, so that means you need to take the lift coefficient and turn it into a lift and then back out the area. So it's a triple O nine airfoil. You're flying at 120 miles an hour. Make sure you convert for airspeed. So you should be operating at this. You're at sea level. So you look up the density. You're at four degrees angle of attack. And so at four degrees angle of attack in the appendix, Get point four two. So we got that, and then you set point four two equal to the lift over the area times Q infinity. So make sure you show your calculation for Q infinity. So you should have got 36.81 for that. We really ought to calculate the Air Reynolds number. Did you guys do that? You're not getting the drag. The CL curve doesn't change much in that angle of attack. Um, I don't have the calculation. Does somebody have the Reynolds number? Anybody do that? can always do that. Uh, we're not given the cord, are we? Yeah, that's because we're backing out S. So you really can't calculate on the Reynolds number because they're not given the cord. So we'd have to go down and calculate the area and then calculate the cord and then go back and recalculate the Reynolds number. I don't want you to do that. All right, so we're given the lift. We're calculating Q infinity. We know CL, so then you solve uh, for the area. One point nine feet squared. So I've given you intermediate answers. There's velocity, dynamic pressure, CL from the graph. And again, show the graph. Show the points. No, when I say show the graph, copy the thing from the appendix again and show the point. All right, first page of the assignment says copy the page from the book and show the point you picked. Yeah, like this thing. Right? Show it for the zoomers here. I want a copy like that. And again, make it obvious where you pick the point. Notice I put a big circle. Can you see that? If you put a little tiny point there and we can't find it, then we can't find it. So show it clearly, boldly, with confidence. So on those two, you need the, the copies of the pages. 5.6, you don't need to do this. You're going to pick off a bunch of points. But I don't want you pointing, putting all those points on a, a copy.
But what you do need is a table. where you do this. So you pick points for all the different angles of attack, CLCD, and then you calculate the lift over drag. And the reason we do this is this is a measure of efficiency of the airfoil. You want lift on an airplane to counteract gravity, but you want to be able to do it with as small amount of drag as you can per lift. So if you maximize CL over CD, you're at the most efficient point for your airfoil. So a spot check here at an angle of attack of 5. I get a CL of 0 0.75, 73. <coughs> the ratio is 102.74. <clears throat> and I did this in Excel. I put these in an Excel spreadsheet and then plotted CL over CD and picked off the max. But you want to find, you can do it in a table if you want. You need to identify the maximum CL over CD and what angle of attack. Do you want us to report back to what angle of attack that happened before? Yeah, that's what they're looking for, right? No, it says find L over D max, but you're doing a table, so just circle the whole thing okay. where the maximum is. Where did you get a formula for the airfoil? So you did you plotted CL over CD versus CL? No, it's, it just gives you the lift coefficient, and then the drag is a function of the lift coefficient. Yeah. I just went along with that and just used the drag coefficient for that, so I didn't really use the attack. So you plotted it on this axis? Yeah, of, I, used, I used that axis. But you had to plot CL over CD yeah. versus CL? Yeah. Yeah, it was, okay, that's fine. Just as long as you're, you've calculated all those values and you find the biggest one. All right, so that was uh, five point is it six? Yeah. So then the last one is uh, calculating that pressure coefficient. It's just like the example. Yeah. I'm going to walk over here so I can hear you. Show the way. No, you don't need a copy of the page for this one. Because otherwise you'd be circling. I mean, I guess you could go and put all of the 10 or 12 points that you pick off there, but I'm not asking you to do that. So here you're calculating C sub P from a given pressure. So Q infinity, make sure you show the work for this. That's one half a row, it's at C level, so you look at the density, one half row V squared. Calculate that. You always, all should get that. And then you plug into the formula for this. Should get minus 4.11. Is that what you guys are getting? Yes, thumbs up, no, yep. So that one's easy. Just make sure you show your work, show the calculation for this, show the calculation for this, show the lookup at sea level for the density.
Today we get to talk about some fun stuff. We're going to talk about shock waves. We all know they cause sonic booms, but what are they? So we know that sound waves are what our ears detect. And so if we detect a sonic boom, it must be a pressure change. But where does it come from? So I'm going to motivate that. So let's look first off at, at a pitot tube. Remember, this is a tube where the flow comes in and stops. And initially, we're going to look at a low speed. So here we're talking about Mach number less than 0.3. Have a flow. And it goes into this tube. It's closed off. So if you follow a streamline inside, you get to a point where the velocity is zero. And by definition, the total the pressure there is the total pressure. Because we're low speed, so the total kinetic energy in the one half row of V squared added to the pressure gets converted just into pressure at zero velocity. So along this way, the velocity is going down and the pressure is going up. So if we increase the speed now, let's go to a higher speed. but Mach still less than one, you still get this happening. The flow goes into the tube, the velocity goes down, the pressure goes up. You get a total pressure here. You just can't calculate it from this formula um, inside here because it's compressible flow now. But the flow still goes to zero velocity and we still call that total pressure. And so that still happens, but now let's say, well, the Mach number is greater than one. Okay, sounds reasonable. We should, be, we should be able to fly this tube through the air faster than the speed of sound. We know we can do that. But what happens to the flow? Because here, all the way from free stream, when you start getting close to the tube, the velocity starts going down and the pressure goes up because the pressure disturbance of the tube being here, the fact that it's blocking the flow, those the pressure waves from this disturbance propagate upstream and cause the pressure to go down and the velocity to go up. But those pressure waves propagate due to the presence of the tube at the speed of sound. Because that's what a pressure wave is, is the speed of sound. It's, a pressure wave is a sound wave. Well, if the flow is faster than the speed of sound, those waves can't go upstream against the flow because the flow is too fast. It's like you trying to swim upstream in a river and the river's going at 100 miles an hour. There's no way. So what happens is all of these pressure changes that come from the air being stopped inside the tube all collect together right in front of the tube. And that's what a shock wave is, is the pressure disturbance of that tube being there. But instead of it occurring gradually in front of the tube, it happens all at once. So all the way up until the shock wave, the flow is V infinity the pressure is still P infinity, and then all those pressure disturbances collect all together and you get a real high jump in velocity, I mean pressure, and the velocity goes down. And if it's a really strong shock wave, the velocity goes from supersonic on this side 
the subsonic on this side. And so that's where all those pressure changes due to the tube being there occur. Same deal with an airplane going faster than the speed of sound. A shock wave comes off of it and it's all of the pressure disturbances of it disturbing the air all collecting together. This, pro <clears throat> this process, the shock wave, is not isentropic. Remember when we derived the uh, isentropic flow relationships and uh, all of the equations that have to do with the speed of sound and the compressible flow equations? We assumed isentropic flow. <clears throat> no heat transfer, no friction. Well, inside this shock wave, there's a lot of friction. So it's not isentropic. So we cannot model the shock wave with the isentropic flow equations. And in fact, it's complicated enough that we don't model it at all in this class. You'll do that in, I think, arrow two. So that's what causes a shock wave. Let's see what happens to tiny pressure disturbances from an object that's moving below the speed of sound and faster than the speed of sound. So I've said they collect in front here. All right, so the first experiment thought we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at a tiny object. Moving at a speed less than the speed of sound. So it's subsonic. So <clears throat> here's the object right now, so we're gonna call that t equals zero, our current time, and one second ago, it was over here. So currently it's here, here it was at one second, and because it was moving through the flow in this direction, so now we're looking at it as an outside observer, we're not riding on the little disturbance, and you can think of this as like a little BB. So the distance that it travels in one second is less than the speed of sound times one because it's moving less than the speed of sound. Well, this thing, as it moved through this region, created a small pressure disturbance, and that pressure disturbance radiated outward at the speed of sound. So in one second, that pressure disturbance is going to get out in front of the object. And it goes out all the way around. So the distance out to this thing is the speed of sound times one second. Since the little BB was moving less than the speed of sound, the wave moved faster than the BB, and so the BB stays behind that wave front that it created. And in fact, the BB at each point along the path that it got from minus one seconds to one second creates another little pressure disturbance because it disturbs the air at that point. Moves a little further, disturbs the air there, moves a little further, so each spot you get a wave coming out, and the time that it has to, to move outward is always ahead of where the BB is because the BB is moving slower. So far, so good. Okay, now we're gonna look at the case where the BB's moving faster than the speed of sound. So I'm gonna leave my circle up here because the BB still creates a disturbance here. It's a pressure disturbance that goes out at the speed of sound. But the difference now is that because it's moving faster than the speed of sound, We 
which we call supersonic. In one second, the BB is going to be over here. Because the distance is greater than the speed of sound times one second, because it's going faster than the speed of sound. So you can see that the BB is out in front of that wave front. And so when it sits at this position, it could not have disturbed the air in front of it, because the air in front of it only gets disturbed after this far, and the BB is already way out here. So I'm going to draw now a situation with an object moving faster than the speed of sound, and we're going to do it for five time steps instead of just one. So we're going to see where these waves end up after all of the different time steps. I have a calibrated string here to do this. So on this string, hopefully you can see it on the screen. Well, no, you can't. But So I have a distance marked. This is how far the BB moves per second. It's from this finger here, this finger here, to this finger here. How far the sound wave goes in that one second is shorter than that because the object's moving faster than the speed of sound. So it goes this far. The sound goes this far. The object goes this far. And so I'm going to mark off the object going five time steps down, and then I'm going to mark off the circles that each one of those BBs creates during that time step. And this board is a little smaller than I usually use, so hopefully this will fit on here. We're going to start all the way over to the right. So here's the BB, and it's T minus 5, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So here's where the BB was five seconds ago. Here's where it was four seconds ago. Here's where it was three seconds ago. Here's where it was two seconds ago. Here's where it was one second ago, and here's where it is now. All right, so now we're going to add the sound waves. So this sound wave had one second to propagate. I'm going to take my distance that's less than that. And so this sound wave got all the way out to here. Because it had one second to get that far. And then this one had two seconds, so it gets twice as far out. I'm just going to draw a part of these circles because we really only need the top half. This one had three seconds, so the sound goes out this far. And that was three seconds, right? Yeah, okay, here's four. So sound waves out to here. And then five seconds. We're five times as far out. So we're out to here. And I'm only drawing those five again. At each point that the BB was at in between, it generated another pressure disturbance as it went through the flow in that region. So those are all the pressure disturbances that were created by the BB at those different snapshots. And the pressure disturbance as from the BB at zero is just right here, because that's when we took our picture. 
So here's an object moving faster than the speed of sound. And I think it's, uh, I think the distance is here. Put it at about Mach 2.2. And we look at this, and if you start imagining, well, if we fill in some of the intermediate points, you get more arcs, like this one would be up here, this would be up here, and you can see that there's a, a, a line along here where all of the pressure disturbances are collecting. So let's draw a line down this way, tangent to all of these. And in fact, it really would be a line if we put all of the infinitely number of points, the pressure disturbances here. And then let's figure out what this distance up to this line is. I drew it perpendicular to the line here. Well, that is just out to the arc, so this is five times the speed of sound. This distance is four, three, two, one. So that arc after five seconds got out five units. And then the distance here is its own velocity times five seconds, because that's how far the object went in five seconds. So the sound wave went that far in five seconds. The object went farther because it's faster than the speed of sound. And we can calculate the angle. This is called mu. This is a shock wave angle. We can calculate that angle really easily now from the geometry. So it looks like we have opposite over adjacent, right? Let me make sure I drew this picture right. No, the picture is right. I just want to make sure I have the distances right. Yeah, sorry, I just said the wrong thing. This is the opposite, and then this is the hypotenuse. That was why I was getting messed up in my head. Right, this is the adjacent. There's the right triangle. The adjacent, the opposite, the hypotenuse. And so the sine of mu is 5 times a over 5 times v. And so the sine of mu, flip the a down to the bottom, cancel out the fives, and that angle is directly calculable from the Mach number that you're flying at. Which makes sense because you're flying at a higher Mach number, you get further down the road, and that's going to make that angle even smaller. And we were talking about tiny pressure disturbances here that propagate at the speed of sound. So often, this, the book, and many people call this the Mach angle for small pressure disturbances. And the reason I say that is if you have a really big object going through the air, like an asteroid entering the atmosphere or something big, the angle will be different because it disturbs the air in front of it, not at this angle because it's so big, and then eventually that wave will come off at this angle. But this is a pretty good calculation of an airplane flying through the air. What is the angle that the sonic boom makes with its flight path? And so all you need to do is know the Mach number, and you can calculate the angle of the sonic boom. And how are we doing on time? Oh, we've got some time. Okay, good. Whenever you see like a plane moving at a supersonic speed, you see like the thing in front of it. That angle of that like thing in front of it, is that the mock angle? Yeah, in fact, 
you'll do a homework problem exactly like that. So let's draw an airplane. So I think I'm hearing you right. You're talking about here's an airplane up here flying at like Mach 3 that way, right? And so a shock wave comes off of that like this at an angle mu. So you're down here on the ground and you're looking up. Not a great person, but they're supposed to be looking up. You see the airplane go overhead. Do you hear the shock wave or the sonic boom? Ah, because you don't hear the sonic boom until this shock wave pressure disturbance moves past you. So in fact, this distance here versus the altitude will tell you how long it will take for the shock wave to hit you. And that's, of course, is the cool thing that the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels or any supersonic aircraft do um, when they're doing an air show. They don't go over the speed of sound, but they'll circle around and back behind the crowd, right? And then they come overhead almost at the speed of sound. So you see them go overhead and they're in front of you and then you hear the engines and the sound of the flight. You don't hear a sonic boom because they're not going supersonic, but it takes that much time for the sound to get just down to you from their flight. And so this, you can, then this is the homework problem you'll solve is if an airplane's flying at Mach something at an altitude, how long behind when you see the plane go over do you uh, hear the, sh the shock wave or the sonic boom? Obviously, if you're down on the ground, like in that air show environment, and the airplane is an enemy airplane, they will shoot you before you even know they're there because you can't hear them. And that was the scary thing they were talking about with that V-2 rocket that Germany had, was that it would explode before you even knew it was headed toward you. So my fundamental advice is don't ever get in a war. Okay, here's a couple examples. Let's calculate various mock angles. So you guys do these. Pull out your calculator, your cell phone. Let's calculate the mock angles. It's pretty much the shockwave angle trailing behind an object flying this fast. So you just take the inverse sine of the ratio or one over the Mach number. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And let's list them up here. Yeah, the formula is the sine, sine of mu equals one over the Mach number. So mu is let's do degrees. Um, I can picture that better. As you can tell, I'm not that great of an artist, even drawing lines sometimes. So you got, anybody got Mach 1? 
Yeah. And this is what's called a normal shock because of 90 degrees. And the object's barely flying at the speed of sound. This is really weak. So do we have 1.5? What'd you get? 41.8. Somebody else give me Mach 2. 30 degrees. How did I do with my drawing? Did that look like 30 degrees when I was getting that Mach 2.2? What do we have for this? 16.2? 15.26. So look at this. Here's an object going Mach 3. 15 degrees is not a lot, right? Shockwave really goes. How about Mach 5? Sorry, shout it out. 11.5. So that's how you can calculate the angle of the shock wave. Is the shock wave louder the shock wave at angle? Yeah, I'm pretty sure the strength of the shock wave because of the, there's a much larger pressure disturbance because there's more energy. We talked about when the an, a object gets closer and closer to the speed of sound or faster than the speed of sound, you get extra drag. Remember that the drag went up and they called that the sonic barrier or the sonic wall because the drag increased so much. This is not a complete ex explanation. You'll have to wait for arrow two for that. But here's an illustration of why we get extra drag due to a shock wave. So imagine an, a wedge-shaped object. And it's flying at, let's make it, which one had 30 degrees? That was Mach 3, right? Or Mach 2, I've forgotten. Mach 2, so let's make it Mach 2 just because I can draw that. So here's your wedge. Got a sharp knife edge on the front. It's going this direction. And so you get shock wave at 30 degrees. And remember what happens across the shock wave. You get low pressure and then you get high pressure behind the shock wave. Really high pressure because the flow goes from high velocity to the lower velocity behind the shock wave. And so you get this high pressure acting on the wedge, and that creates a backward force. If you take the component of that pressure backward, you get more drag from that than you would if you were going subsonic. Now, it's not the complete story because you go, well, what happens to the flow as it goes around the back? Because maybe it pushes this way. But you do get that high pressure, and then as it goes around the object, it will, the pressure will go down. And so you get a net backward force due to this high pressure behind the shock wave. And so this is a really simple explanation or illustration of why maybe a way you can remember that you get wave drag from supersonic flow. The wave drag, of course, comes even if you're subsonic on an airfoil because we talked about how if you're near the critical or above the critical Mach number, your flow can be subsonic. But as it goes around the airfoil, there can be places where the Mach number is greater than one locally. And so you get shock waves off of parts of the airfoil and you get the wave drag from that as well. So shock waves cause extra drag called wave drag. And you have to add that to the other drag that you get from whatever the object is. Um, I think we're close to out of time. Next time, remind me, I still need to talk about thin airfoils versus thick airfoils. Um, and how we can calculate, no, sorry, thin airfoils, how we can calculate lift to drag for supersonic flight. Because subsonic flight, we know how to calculate from the airfoil tables. And then we did that Prandtl-Glauert adjustment for Mach numbers less than 0.7.
supersonic flight, there's some ways to calculate CL and CD and CM. But we're done for today. Quiz next Wednesday. Please show up on time.